Good morning, church. Happy Sunday. All right, let's all get to our seats, get ready to sing. There we go. Tell me whose side are you fighting on? I'm fighting on the Lord's side. Tell me whose side are you fighting on? I'm fighting on the Lord's side. Well, I'm fighting, I'm fighting, I'm fighting, I'm fighting, I'm fighting on the Lord's side. Fighting, I'm fighting, I'm fighting, I'm fighting, I'm fighting on the Lord's side. Tell me whose side are you singing on? I'm singing on the Lord's side. Tell me whose side are you singing on? I'm singing on the Lord's side. Well, I'm singing, I'm singing, I'm singing, I'm singing, I'm singing on the Lord's side. Singing, I'm singing, I'm singing, I'm singing, I'm singing on the Lord. Tell me whose side are you praying on? I'm praying on the Lord. Tell me whose side are you praying on? I'm praying on the Lord. Well, I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying on the Lord. Praying, I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying on the Lord. Tell me whose side are you loving on? I'm loving on the Lord. Tell me whose side are you loving on? I'm loving on the Lord. Well, I'm loving, I'm loving, I'm loving, I'm loving, I'm loving on the Lord. Loving, I'm loving, I'm loving, I'm loving, I'm loving on the Lord. Tell me whose side are you serving on? I'm serving on the Lord. Tell me whose side are you serving on? I'm serving on the Lord. Well, I'm serving, I'm serving, I'm serving, I'm serving, I'm serving on the Lord. Serving, I'm serving, I'm serving, I'm serving, I'm serving on the Lord. Tell me whose side are you fighting on? I'm fighting on the Lord. Tell me whose side are you fighting on? I'm fighting on the Lord. Well, I'm fighting, I'm fighting, I'm fighting, I'm fighting, I'm fighting on the Lord. Fighting, I'm fighting, I'm fighting, I'm fighting, I'm fighting on the Lord. All right, we're going to sing uh, I Hear God Singing to Me. If you notice, there's not a, a lot of instruments or any instruments on the stage this morning, so all the music is going to come from us. Um, but that's a great opportunity. If you guys can just um, understand and imagine that we are in the presence of God right now. Amen. So when we sing, just take a moment. It doesn't matter if you're singing the right notes or not. Close your eyes and, and understand that we are here to worship God. So let's do I Hear God Singing to Me. Well, I hear God singing to me. Every nation must be saved. Well, I hear God singing to me. Every challenge must be braved. Well, I feel God's spirit in me. Quench it not too much at stake. Well, I hear God singing to me. I hear God sing for Jesus' sake. I hear God sing for Jesus say why he I hear God sing to me 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 I hear God singing and rejoicing and I love my father's song I hear God singing and he saying Everyone should sing along. Righteous singing scares the devil. So let's shout our anthems loud. A soldier's choir in holy concert. Voices lifted, faces bowed. I hear God singing to me. 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 Gather us and start a movement. Scatter us, we scatter seeds. Planting Christ in every nation as our great crusade succeeds. And you can criticize us, we grow stronger. Kill us and for sure we win. For our battle isn't earthly and our souls will never end. Why he? I hear God singing to me. I 
song because I heard it was after the second song, but I was outside saying hello to people. There's a lot of people I'd love to uh, welcome today. I'm just going to give a general welcome uh, to all of you uh, today, but um, I'm going to introduce the guy doing the welcome. <laughs> you know, every once in a while, you get to meet an extraordinary human being. And I had the privilege of meeting an extraordinary human being about 17 years ago who is a the real deal man of God, a true soldier of Christ, a man who takes the Lord with him everywhere he goes. Amen. I'd like you to give a welcome back to Rodney Fuller. <clears throat> yes, I'm doing the welcome and not preaching. Um, I, I will say first, uh, it is great to be home. Um, Jennifer obviously is not here with me. She uh, got back, I know, I know. She got back late last night from uh, San Francisco visiting our youngest daughter, Lindsay, who's living out there now. Uh, they had a fantastic time. And a good buddy of mine got married yesterday, so that's why I'm in town. <clears throat> and I was considering leaving right after the wedding and I told Jennifer, I, I can't. I, I've got to come to Northview. And uh, I've got to walk in the doors, hug some folks, and get my fill. Um, and uh, we, Jennifer and I, um, you know, you, you have relationships. You uh, go to a place and you, you, you miss them. But then there's the kind of missing that actually hurts. That's how we feel. We miss you to the point that it hurts. And uh, I will say it's been a journey. Um, there's lots that, you know, I'd, I'd love to share with you, but, you know, right now I, I won't do that. But um, this, this, this really is our home. Um, you mean so much to us, and welcome for all of you. <laughs> all of you who are viewing online, welcome uh, to the Northview Church and this experience you know, here today. I want to give you this before I sit down. I believe Sajin is preaching today, correct? Yes. Sajin uh, has prepared a message, I don't know what it is, but he's prepared a message that he's prayed about, that he's labored over, that he's brought before God, maybe even gotten some input about. I'd like to encourage you to at least take, try to take one thing that he says today, just one. But because this is a holistic experience, something you get today, it might not come from the sermon. It may come from your fellowship. It may come from something you hear something you see, but today take into account that the Spirit of God is here, Amen. Amen. that he is moving and that he is communicating. And so I want to encourage you all today, young 
middle-aged, older, to be an explorer today. My journey <clears throat> is in seeking Jesus and seeking God in the midst of heartache. Not pulling away when there's so many things right now saying, hey, you know what? You've put in your time. Just come on, settle in. There's sometimes I go to church and I made it. I made it. I'm sitting down. I'm like, okay, I'm here. Some of you are here on purpose. Some of you are here maybe by accident. <laughs> Some of you may have come here today just wanting, I wonder what Sergeant's going to say today. I wonder what the fellowship's going to be like today. Explore what the Spirit Amen. has to say. Amen. And so it's been a drive, a, a push. I'm like, I have to look for God in the midst of heartache. So what do I share? What do I, what do I look for in my time with God, in my study, in my prayer, in my walks? And those are the things I'm looking for. I'm looking for Jesus somewhere. I'm looking for God somewhere. Not just necessarily a sign, but I want to see him. I want to feel him, even when my heart is aching. And so uh, a, a hallmark passage for me is out of Psalm 126, verses 5 and 6. That I go out carrying seed to sow in tears, knowing that it's not in vain. So I want to encourage you to explore today. For those of you that are younger and you're like, I don't know what to explore, take heart. You know why? I'm 58 and there's many days I still say, I don't know. I don't know. I don't get it. Jennifer and I look at each other and we're like, yeah, I don't know anymore. <laughs> Not about each other. <laughs> but that's fine. But just start exploring, asking questions, challenging things. For those of you that are in the middle somewhere or, or older, however old you are, don't let your passion for God die. At any rate, welcome. <laughs> it is great to be here with you, and let's see what the Spirit does for us today. Amen? Amen. Um, do I pray also? Okay, let's pray. <laughs> Dear Father, thank you so much for your incredible grace and your mercy. We thank you, Father, for your sovereign heart, your sovereign will. We thank you for your mercy, your patience, your guidance, your abundant love. We thank you for your wisdom. We thank you, Father, for your providence. We thank you for putting us in places, Father, where you are, that perhaps we can reach out and find you. Father, I pray for the comfort of so many that are, are hurting and and wondering uh, about their lives, whether it be spiritually, emotionally, health-wise, for other family members, Father, for the loss that many have suffered and going through, Father. I pray for their uplift, for their strength, for their courage, Father, for their spiritual eyesight that they can see you and feel you. Father, I pray for those that are in the mode of being comforters, that, Father, we will not say things just to fill up space. That many times the most wisest thing to do is say nothing, but to sit in the space of grief and hurt and be there, be present. Father, help us to feel your spirit this day. Help us to understand and decipher what your spirit is speaking to us. And in the cases where we don't know, Father, work with us. Put your healing, strong, caring hand on us today. Guide us, Father. Be with Sajan as he preaches and brings your word today. Thank you for the singing, Father. Be with us as we sing songs, as we take part in communion, Father, as we fellowship and we remember you. 
through Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand. In preparation for communion this morning, we're going to sing together, Lamb of God. So I woke up this morning and uh, I think it's allergies or something. My voice started acting a little weird. So I hope you hear the Holy Spirit through me, whether my voice cracks or not. Um, But by a show of hands, please raise your hand if you're very excited on this Master's Sunday. That would be me. Nice. Uh, I'm Spencer Bright. If you could turn with me to Mark chapter 10, that's where I'm going to begin. It's very much an honor to be able to speak with you guys and prepare us for the Lord's Supper. Again, that's uh, Mark chapter 10. So in Mark 10, verses 13 through 16, it says, People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. So there's plenty of angles to look at in this passage, but one that I see is joy. And just the joy that Jesus is able to see in the kids. And I'm sure through all of the experiences that he's going through, it's very refreshing just to be able to 
make some jokes, to, to have a good time, to be in a lighthearted mood um, with the kids. And I've experienced this some myself, being able to have the opportunity to teach the threes a little bit here. And, uh, you know, they're, they're a blast. We'll uh, go in the playroom and they'll hop in the ball pit and they have this little Hot Wheels toy that's like spring loaded and they'll hit it and it spins around and they love that. They love the Play-Doh. I love snack time. Um, you know, that's my favorite part. But uh, they may not be as zealous for the cleaning up part of everything, but for all the games, you know, they, they really enjoy it. Um, and so now if you'll turn to Hebrews 12, I'll look at a different facet um, of joy here. We'll be in Hebrews 12, 2, and I'll start in the second half of the verse. It says, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. This scripture begins with the joy set before him, which kind of alludes to the fact that Jesus didn't experience any present moment joy in, um, you know, being on the cross and enduring that. But he had a steadfast or a long-term joy for the victory over sin and death that he would bring by willingly enduring the cross. And Jesus was willing to take on all of our shame and all of our sin because he had a vertical perspective and knowing that his, his purpose was to fulfill God's will and going up on the cross. And all of those things, knowing that steadfast, that long-term joy is what, um, you know, allowed him to endure the cross. So I hope this morning that you're able to take the Lord's Supper with the joy of a little child, placing your full trust in him without hesitation. But if that's not the place that you're in, maybe you're experiencing some heartache like was discussed earlier. You know, I hope that you're able to really experience the long term and the steadfast joy. Um, and, you know, just know that if you've put on Christ through baptism, you've been cleansed of your sins. You have the Holy Spirit with you working in every situation and you will live eternally with Christ when he returns. And so in this time of communion, I encourage you to think of whichever joy resonates with you in this moment. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for today. Thank you just for the ways that you work in our lives through every situation um, and just conversations I'd had earlier reminding me that in some circumstances we may not even see the fruit of the situations or things that we're dealing with, but I'm just grateful for the ways that you love us, for the ways that uh, you just provide us so much peace, and uh, I'm just so grateful to be here this morning. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Now is the time in the service where we'll take up the offering. If you will bow your heads with me. God, thank you so much just for giving us such a great church, a great place to meet, but uh, also just, you know, so many great things that we can do with all of the funds that people are willing to give. And I just pray that it's out of the joy that we have for you, whether it be present moment or uh, that long suffering just from remembering Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, that it's able to soften our hearts and, um, you know, really put our hearts in the right place to give. Just thank you again so much for all that you do for us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Spencer. Uh, just a couple quick announcements before we uh, dismiss our children. Um, we're so far ahead of schedule. Um, I guess I can welcome the Gardner family back, too. It's another, it's just a kind of a welcome back Sunday for us. Uh, just to answer all the questions, no, he's not coming back. Uh, Rodney got to answer the question. He's here for a wedding. And, uh, Fenton is working on his PhD and he needs some concentrated time over two weeks and so you, um, but uh, his leadership group has given him two weeks to really focus on his uh, his uh, dissertation or something to get his PhD and uh, so you can be praying for Fenton and, and uh, Natasha and Chloe and Noel it's great to have you guys here as always um, um, a couple Brief announcements. One is uh, this Saturday night is going to be our daddy-daughter dance. Uh, the last day to register is today because uh, all the setup is going to be done on Wednesday. We have over 100 people coming, which will be really exciting. Um, I'm thrilled how many different uh, age daughters and dads are coming. Uh, we have all range. It's going to be a very special night. And so if you need to register, if you haven't yet, please do it today. Uh, there's a QR code up there. We can, it's also on the TV out screen out here. It's also in the bulletin if you need that. Uh, next is the, uh, just a quick thing. We usually have the women's midweek the week after the men's midweek. Uh, this week is not the women's midweek, though. We're skipping one week, so it's not until the 24th, I believe. Yeah, the 24th. So please don't come this Wednesday. We'd love to have you, actually. Uh, we're actually going to have a teen-led service next Sunday. And they're going to be here practicing, so if you want to help them and be like the crowd for them, that'd be great to have you. Are the Brumleys here? Are they, are they here yet? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. I was going to introduce their new little baby, but they didn't make it this morning. They thought they were, they were trying their best. Uh, is there any other announcements up there that I'm uh, missing? You can just put it up there, and I'll tell you whether we can go through it. I think that's it, though, right? Let's see. Oh, yeah. Uh, healthcare providers, there is a free lunch. And I believe that's, yeah, the Sunday the 28th. Uh, you do need to sign up and register for that as well. You can see Melinda Segedy, who's organizing that. Uh, last thing I want to do before we, we uh, dismiss the kids is welcome back, although she's never come to Northview, uh, Janae Smith. A lot of you know her from the women's retreat, her and her husband Christian, and Caden and Asia. Their kids are here. Why don't you guys stand up so we can say hello to you. I've never heard uh, such glowing reports Across the board, Janae, I mean, like, I'm like, gosh, everybody loved Janae. So, Christian, now I understand why you love her so much. Anyway, we're going to dismiss kids. If your children are fifth grade or below, we ask you to check them in here in the registration table. They'll go to class. Middle school and high school, you're staying in here for the sermon. We'll stand for a song, and then Sadra will come to preach. All right, everybody, let's stand up. We're going to sing one more song before the sermon. Most of you know this one. We're going to sing Bound to the Rock. To the Jews who had believed, Jesus said, Hold to my teachings, and you're really my disciples, and the truth will set you free. To the 
the Jews who had believed Jesus said, Hold to my teachings and you're really my disciples and the truth will set you free. Now I'm bound to the rock by my faith in the Lord and I'm fighting back the devil with the word as my sword. Bound to the rock by my faith faith in the Lord, and I'm fighting back the devil with the word as my soul. Let's have all the women sing. To the Jews who had believed, Jesus said, hold to my teachings, and you're really my disciples, and the truth all right, guys, here we go. you free. To the Jews who had believed, Jesus said, Hold to my teachings, then you're really my disciples, and the truth will set you free. Now I'm bound to the rock by my faith in the Lord, and I'm fighting back the devil with the word as my sword. Bound to the rock by my faith in the Lord, I'm bound to the rock and 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 I'm bound to the rock bound to the rock for my faith come on in the Lord well I'm bound to the rock 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 I'm bound to the rock well I'm bound to the rock for my faith in the altos well, I'm bound to the rock, 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 bound to the rock, I'm bound to the rock. Everybody, here we go. In the Lord, Jesus said, I did not bound to the rock, but instead I rock, I'm bound to the rock, but there is no rock for the man who's hard to stop. The shadow is a grave, and I'm bound to the rock, I'm bound to the rock, and I'm bound to the rock. And I'm bound to the rock, and I'm bound to the rock, and I'm bound, and I'm bound, and I'm bound, and I'm bound, and I'm bound to the rock, I'm bound to the rock, and 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 I'm bound, 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 and I'm Please be seated. Good morning, church. Wow, what a morning so far. So many new instruments in the room. Oh, so good. We sound so good. Uh, I'm going to jump right into the lesson itself. Uh, the lesson is called, I Will Stand Before You. So, um, <laughs> well, I was, a, I was a missionary in India, and uh, I flew out there, and India's baggage management on their airlines, not the best. And so I flew there, and they all told me, You're gonna lose the, they're going to lose your baggage, it's not going to be fun. And I lost my baggage. <laughs> and uh, the, the bags came in in about a week. And in order to get the bags, you have to get to the airport. Now, to get to the airport, you need a special pass. So you have to stand in line for the special pass for about four hours. So you get there, stand in line for the special pass. And then once you have the special pass, you have to go to the door or the gateway that helps you to get into the actual airport itself with your special pass. So I get in, and, and, and that took about an hour, hour and a half. And then we, we went to the baggage claim center to see if your bag was really there. And I found my bag. It was glorious. It was, I was so grateful. I was in India for the first time that I could remember. I didn't have my clothes or much of anything. Uh, and I finally got my bag. And so I got my bag, and we had to go through security to get out. That was another two and a half hour wait. And, and as I was going there, as I was going there, they, they opened up my bag and the, and the guy looked at me and goes, 100 bucks. 
and, I, and I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, what? Okay, this was all new to me. What? Yeah, he wanted a, <laughs> he wanted a hundred, he wanted a hundred dollars. Now I've been in line for going on five, six hours with a group of people. And uh, by the way, it's improved tremendously in the last 20 years, so you won't have any of this. Uh, but this guy had been sit- standing next to me, and he was this older man. And uh, as we got, as we got to, to there, he was talking to me, and, and he said, you're almost done, Sajin. Almost done. You're almost going to get out of here. So I, I get to that place. The guy says, I want $100. So I, I didn't know what to do. I didn't have 100 bucks. I wasn't sure I'd give it to him if I had it. I, I, I didn't know what to do. And the guy next to me, I kind of froze. And the guy next to me goes, what are you doing? Are you bribing him? Are you, I want to call, talk to a police officer. Please, please, come. And the guy, the guy took my bag, threw it. It was open. Threw it out the door. He goes, get out. I was happy to do it. I was, I was like, that was, that was great. I went, grabbed my clothes, threw it in. I gave a thumbs up to the other guy. And it, it, was, it was glorious. It was one of those moments. But you know, you know, there's moments in our lives, there's times in our lives where we feel absolutely helpless. The world does things, right or wrong, good or bad. The world does things, and it does things to you, and they affect you. And some of us, we come out punching, like Will Smith comes out punching, you know? Uh, I meant in the movie, in the movie he came out punching, with the aliens. That is actually what I meant. But, but you know, some of us come out, come out aggressive. Some of us freeze. And some of us come out aggressive in different situations, and some of us freeze in different situations. We don't really know. We think we know, but we don't know until it happens to us. I froze. And I needed somebody who would stand before me. I needed somebody with credibility. I needed somebody who understood the system and understood what this guy was asking me to do. And I needed him to speak up for me. And I'll tell you, I I didn't remember the weight. I don't remember the line. I don't remember the, the, the poor treatment. I don't remember any of that. What I remember is this guy standing up for me. It was amazing. And, and, and still, that's the, that's the residue. That's the emotional residue I feel walking away from that. I mean, here, 20 years later, that's what I feel is this guy standing up for me. And I would, I would say that for us, there are moments in our lives where we, where we are challenged by the world and we need somebody to stand before us. Let's rise for the reading of God's word. Exodus chapter 17, as I read, I'd ask you to do this. Focus on the words. Ask what the Holy Spirit is trying to speak to you as God's word is being read. The Bible reads in verse 1, The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses and said, give us some water to drink. Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water and they grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt and make us and our children and our livestock die of thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, what am I to do with these people? They are, they are almost ready to stone me. The Lord answered Moses, go out in front of the people, take with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff which you struck the Nile, and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb, strike the rock, and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the place Massah and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord, saying, is the Lord amongst us or not? Father, as we come before you, as we read your word, as, Father, we stop our, our, 
active minds and we reflect on you. We ask that, Father, you work this morning. You work within our hearts. And, Father, it, it is, it's transforming our lives as we do so. I pray that, Father, you guide us and then, Father, we can leave this time a little closer to you and, and different from when we walked in. We love you and pray this in your son's name. Amen. So we've started a new series on the living water. So for those of us who were here last week, I shared an, a physical attribute about myself that, uh, that, that, that continues to stand true. What was that physical attribute? What's that? Only half my body sweats, that's, that's true. What's the consequence of only half my body sweating? I, I don't feel thirsty. I haven't felt thirsty in decades. I, I, I drink water because my wife's a really great example of drinking water. But I do know this. I may not feel physically thirsty for water, but there is a constant, there is a constant thirst I have in my heart for, so, for, for other things. And, and these other things are to be accepted. These other things are to be, to be liked. Uh, the, the sociologists and the psychologists, they said, you know, there's core needs human beings have. One of those core needs is to be known and to be loved and accepted in the knowing. And I'd say that's about true for all of us, that we want to be known. But we're, we're afraid because if you know me, you may not like me. And we talked about that last week, Right? Because the Bible says this, it's a core need. It's something we want to do, and yet we fight it because of a fear. And then, and then when somebody loves us, there's this other voice in our head that says, well, if you really knew me, you wouldn't love me. Not like this, not so unconditionally, not so, not so much. And so these two things are battling, and they create a thirst within our hearts, within our relationships, within the way we manage ourselves within the world, and it manifests itself in different ways, right? And so some of us, to, to, because we want to be liked or accepted or we want to be known, we, we, we act a certain way, but, or we, we, we perform a certain way, we think a certain way. It, this creates a thirst, this, this angst of being wanting to be known and yet still fearing being known. And this thirst, it, it's not met, as we read last week, by anything here on earth. But we feel it. So what are some things we do to thirst, uh, to quench that thirst? What are some things that we can do? What's that? Buy a car. Buy a car. <laughs> yes, we can buy a car. And there is something, that new car smell. You kind of sit there. Uh, I, was, I, was in a, I, was in a, I was in a brother's car the other day and yesterday, and it was just, you sat there and you're like, ah, this is a nice car. This is a nice car. All the gadgets around, the sound of the engine. I couldn't see over the hood. Um, <laughs> it was one of those cars. Uh, it was pretty glorious. What else do we do? What else do we do to quench this thirst? Get a puppy. Some, some, <laughs> that actually works. <laughs> I got to tell you. <laughs> puppy knows you. Puppy loves you. By the way, Kenny has one if you need one. And, uh, <laughs> um, we do several things. All, all the time, we're constantly doing. We're constantly posturing. We're constantly trying to, trying to get this thirst met, fill this hole within our hearts. Um, and we see that with the Israelite people. The Israelite people, they're leaving Egypt. They have just left Egypt. And I want you to ask, I want you to think for just a second, what did they just see? At the, be, before they got to this point, what had they seen? So this is, this is Exodus 17, 16, 15. What had they just witnessed in the land? Manna. They, had, they saw manna and coil. So this is, this is crazy. They'd wake up in the morning, and food was everywhere. It covered the ground. And they'd wake up every single morning. And you think, that'd be cool if that was true for me. Well, actually, it's kind of true for us. We're able to do something similar. 
What else did, what else had they witnessed? The the Red What's that? The parting, of the, Red sea. the parting of the Red Sea. And, it, and, and they, they said that the amount of time that, uh, the, the, that it took to get to one side to the other was probably about a day of walking. So for a day of walking, they were looking. The Bible says there was water to their right and water to their left. They were walking and they were watching, watching nature yeah. being challenged. They were walking on dry land. What did they see even before them? Deliverance. Plagues. They watched, they watched Moses walk up to the Nile. This, and the Nile was not just a river. The Nile was the giver of life. The Nile was the source of, 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 of Egypt's strength. He walked up to it, hit it with his, with his staff. And it all turned into blood. And, he, and there were ten more, there were nine more plagues that came along. Each of them, a statement from God that says the things that you're trying to quench your thirst with, whether it's the Nile or whether it's this God or that God, let me tell you, there's only one place that it will ever be met. So the Israelite people saw this. And I think it's, it's, I think it's pretty crazy because some of us see it. As, as, you know, as kingdom kids, that's all we've ever seen. And we wonder why, if we've seen miracle after miracle after miracle, why, why freak out when the tough stuff comes? Why? Why, why are they freaking out here? God had just provided quail and manna for them magically. In chapter 16, why would they be so at odds where they would, they would start grumbling against, their, against, against Moses himself? You know, I think, I think for myself, as I, as I evaluate scripture, as I evaluate human beings, we have short memories. Yep. We have short memories. We have short memories of what God has done, and we have short memories of who God is, right? Yeah. We transpose other people into God's position, and, and we play it out in a way that isn't, I think, makes a lot of sense. The people of Israel, they had forgotten something. I have six points I want to make today. Yep, just six. <laughs> I, want us to, I want us to, number one, my wife said, be concise, Sajjan. <laughs> <laughs> number one, I, the Israelites had forgotten that they had never been alone. Like, it, as they were suffering, in their suffering, they had never been alone. In, in the Garden of Eden... In the Garden of Eden, we see there were four ru rivers running through it, right? These rivers gave that garden life. Heaven, in Revelation chapter 22, we, again, we looked at this last week, is, is a city that will be coming down, and it has this river running through it, giving life. And, and in, the, in, this, in, this, in the garden, this life was, was given to us, and it was precious, it was special, and there was something else that was there. It was this connection to God. Man walked with God. Woman walked with God in a way that, that they had not seen up to that point. And they were never alone. And, but the Israelites had forgotten that. And, and before you condemn them too quickly, before you judge them too fast, they're in the middle of a desert. It's hot. And then it's cold. And then it's hot. And, and they may be thirsty, but guess who else is thirsty? Their children are thirsty. And when, when you get to this place where, where, where your physical needs are being so challenged, you tend to forget the things that you've seen in the past. You tend to forget that you're not alone, that God is walking before you. The Israelites here, in this particular moment, forgot that they were they were not alone, that God was with them. The Israelite people, point number two, 
So number one, they had forgotten that they were, they were, they were not alone. Number two, they were disappointed. We see them come. They, 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 they come to him, but there was no water for the people to drink, so they quarreled with Moses, and they said, give us water to drink. There was this amount, there was disappointment that they felt as a people. They had expectations. So they were, they were an enslaved people in Egypt, and they were freed supernaturally by God, and they were taken, and, and they were promised this incredible land of abundance, and yet they... they, they the process of getting to that spot was disappointing. There was scorpions, there were snakes, there was sand, there was heat, there was thirst, there was hunger, and then there were annoying people around them. <laughs> Millions. And, 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 and they were incredibly disappointed because they had these expectations, and these expectations weren't met. And I think for us, we can have expectations we can have expectations of life, and when they're not met, there's such disappointment, right? There's such disappointment. I really wanted to be 5'8". <laughs> it was a life goal. You laugh, but it was a very serious thing for me. I'm 5'4", not 5'8". And, and, and there's this disappointment you just kind of get used to, used to it. And I, I, I kind of laugh at that, but there's much more serious disappointments this room faces. Chairs that are empty. Bills that are coming in. Holidays that have become hollow. Disappointment. Those, those are And in the disappointment, there's, there's this immediate knee-jerk reaction to want to do something. And we see the Israelites doing something. When, when disappointment comes our way, when, when challenges come our way, when the nightmares come, there are things our minds do to try to manage that. Yep. One of the things we do is we rewrite our histories, right? Yeah. We rewrite how things happened. Yeah. And we rewrite it so that we, we place ourselves in a position of, of somehow winning in our minds. And it might be being the victim. We rewrite our histories. When disappointment comes, we blame and we sit in the blame. And when, and when we are disappointed, we are compelled to express it. Now, are any of these things wrong? No. They're not. I think rewriting our history could be argued about. But it's, it's, it's a natural thing. It's why we need each other to kind of give us a sober perspective yeah. Yeah. and help, help us to, to get through. Blaming. Man, there, there are people who should be blamed who should accept responsibility. But when we live there, when we sit there, it's challenging. And now this is where it gets really, really hard, is when we begin to do this with God. Yep. Because God was intended to be the, the thirst quencher for us. He was meant to help us through this moment, and yet we've, we've pushed him away and we've blamed him. And that's what the Israelite people are beginning to do. They, they, they go and they attack Moses, and, and in their hearts, they're like, we would rather be an enslaved people back in Egypt than be here, having this God provide manna for us and quail, and we don't even have any water, what good is it? They, they began to be, their disappointment began to manifest itself in, in angst, and, and it was not fruitful. And so what did they do? They brought a formal charge against, against Moses, really against God. So in the word, the quarrel is, is translated as rib. It's a judicial word, and quarrel means to dispute or bring a formal charge against. 
So when we read that word in the, in the, in the English, it doesn't, it doesn't give us the picture. C.S. Lewis talks a lot about this. Uh, Edward Clowney also talked a lot about it in where, where he talks about God in the dock, where, where humanity takes God and places him on the stand filled with accusations. And, and this is what we do. This is what they were doing. We place God in the dock. We place God on the stand, and we start, to, we start to let him have it. Now, what's really nice is God is able to handle it. His shoulders are broad enough to handle it. And, uh, and, and Moses, though, is like, no, I, I don't want to do this. He goes, to, he goes to God, and he says, they're about to stone me. Now, why is that important? Why is that language important? Stoning is a punishment after a sentence has been given. The people have sentenced him. They have accused him, and they're ready to stone him. They're ready to find him guilty of bringing them out uh, into nowhere. And they want, they want blood. So what does Moses do? Moses does what I think the Israelite nation was meant to do. I think what we were meant to do. When the world comes as, because Moses could have gone the way of the Israelites, right? He could have rewritten history. He could have, he could have, he could have uh, blamed them. He could have done a whole slew of things. But what he did was he turned to God in the midst of all of that. And what does God say to him? God says to him, I will stand before you. The Lord answered Moses, and this is my fourth point, stand before. The Lord, when Moses goes to God, he sa- the Lord answers Moses and says, go out in front of the people, take with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff which you struck the Nile, and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it for the people to drink. Stand before. This is another legal term to be an advocate for or to be a lawyer of, to intervene for. You know, I think back to that, to that place where all the suitcases were, and I look at that uh, the officer who was demanding, uh, uh, demanding money in order for me to get my luggage out, and I, I remember very sweetly my advocate the one who stood before me. And see, this is, this is where the Israelites, this is where we as humanity, we can see the miracles, we can see the plagues, we can see the, the rivers part before us, but I will tell you, it is not enough. It's not enough. When, when the challenges come, if your heart is not filled with this understanding of God's character, we will falter. God says, I will stand before you. And what does, uh, what does God say to him to do? Strike the rock, right? With what? Staff. The staff. Do you know what the staff represents? What does a staff represent in, in this time, in this period? Power, authority, shepherding. shepherding. The staff, the staff has, uh, has a, lot of, a lot of implications, but it represents ultimate authority in some spaces. It's the judge's staff, if you were to say. Uh, it's what was used for punishment. It was to beat those who were guilty. He's to take a staff. He's to take that staff. And what is he to do with it? It's to strike the rock. And from the rock comes water. So the Israelite people, they up, up to this point, they had forgotten that they were never alone, that God was with them. That's the, that's the essential problem, is we forget that we're, we're never alone, that God is there in our pain. He is there. Amen. You know, in the, in the prayer this morning, in the welcome, uh, the, the, uh, the brother talks about the brother talks about this idea of not having to say anything, but be present. And I think that is so much of what God is doing right here, right now. He's being present. And, and he's telling us, you're not going to be alone. 
Disappointment, the way they managed their disappointment when, when, when life comes and gets hard was essential. They tended to quarrel. They tended to accuse. They tended to attack. They brought formal charges. What, they, what, we, what we see in Moses is him turning to God when that comes at him. This is pivotal for us. So how do we turn to God? These are nice, quaint words. How do we turn to God when everything seems, seems like it's a mess, like everything is falling apart? How do we turn to God? We remember. We remember. Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So he strikes the rock. The rock is the authority. The rock is the sentencing. The rock is the, is the punishment. So to, I mean, not the rock. The staff is the authority. It is the punishment. Uh, that was, uh, it was the tool that was used for punishment. And we see that it strikes a rock. In 1 Corinthians 10, it says, For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud, and they all passed through the sea. So the Bible is actually referencing exactly the story we're reading. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them. And that rock was? That rock was Christ. See, what needs to be remembered, what needs to be understood, what, needs to, what God is doing here in this very moment is he's saying, listen, I will stand before you when the accusers come, when Satan comes and he accuses you of all the things that you're actually guilty of. He goes, I will stand before you. And the punishment that you would deserve the sentence that should be upon you, I will place upon the rock. You ever wonder why Moses was, was so uh, challenged by God when he hit the rock twice? The Bible is teaching us something. The Bible is teaching us that God is our advocate and that God hears our, our pleas, God hears our stories. And that the punishment we may have deserved is given to Jesus. See, that's the, that's the peace that you and I can remember. The miracles, we, we're quick to forget when life gets hard. But if we can remember that God loved us so very much that he would step in to die for our sins so that we could have eternal life, would he not be with us through whatever trial or turbulation we're going through right now? Amen. Would he possibly leave us? No, he would not. We are never alone. And that disappointment, because we know we're never alone, we can take that disappointment. We shouldn't just shove it deep down inside. Not a good solution. But we can take it to God. And we can begin to process it with him. The Bible's, the Bible's message for us, so that as Christians, we can, we can be men and women that live in power. That we don't have to be captive to all the challenges that come through our lives. You've seen men and women like that, right? Life gets hard, and, and, and there's some that are just in denial, It'll be okay, brother. God will come through. You're like, what? what's that even mean? <laughs> but then there's that, there's a few. They sit down with you. They put their hand on your shoulder. It'll be okay. It's going to be fine. I don't know how fine is. But there's, there's a message they give. God is that message for us. He sits with us. As, as we watch the challenges of life, as we deal with the heartache and the heartbreak, God stands before us and says, I'm right here. I'm right here with you. And I'm not about to leave you. So what can we do? What can we do that would help us 
to move forward in power. One is try to get a sober understanding of your history. There was, a, there was an argument my wife and I had. I won't go into details as to what it was about. <laughs> I was so sure I was right. I was convinced. And uh, apparently there was a, there was a, a record of it. <laughs> it might have been a videotape. And it was shown to me. And I'm like, it was un indisputable. And I looked at her and I said, I'm sorry. But I'll tell you this, I would have given all of my money away, <laughs> betting that I was right. That's not actually saying a lot. I would, <laughs> I would have. It was, it was amazing how convinced I was. And I was actually startled. I, I stopped and I sat back and I'm like, I was wrong. Holy cow. I really remember this so very differently. And my wife, you know, she's not an I told you so person. But she did smile at me. <laughs> she did smile. I think one of the things we have to do is we have to, in, in the situations, we have to have a sober understanding. We can't allow ourselves to, to go far in, in the rewriting the, the authorship of some of these stories because it just is not helpful. And this is where we have one another. Right. You know, we as a, we as a nation, we, we go through challenging, challenging things. We as a people, as a church, as individuals, go through challenging things. And this is the thing that I've learned. I'm convinced I'm right in a given moment. If we could just pause in our interactions with each other, if we could pause and, and, and go with the spirit of curiosity, go with the spirit of what exactly did happen. Maybe I got it wrong. It's amazing what that brings to our, 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 our fellowship. But it's also amazing what it brings to our hearts. That bitterness, that, that entitlement to be angry begins to dissipate. We begin to deal with some of the real issues. You know, I think the second thing we can do is not to seek to blame. There was a brother. He said something to me. I was angry. I was angry at all this, the, the stuff that was happening. And, and the people that were bringing the stuff. And he sat down with me. He, he goes, Sajin, if it's flesh and blood, it ain't your enemy. According to scripture, he said, Sajin, it is, this, it is the spiritual forces of darkness that are your enemy. They may be using people, but it is the spiritual forces of darkness that are your enemy. If you can remember that flesh and blood the person sitting next to you, the person that, 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 that irritates you, not the person sitting next to you, whatever the other person is. They, they are not your enemy. They are not your enemy. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> they are not your enemy. Rather, it's the spiritual forces of darkness that see. We've seen that in the last few years, haven't we? We've seen that. We've seen, we've seen spiritual forces of darkness come into our churches, come into our hearts, come into our families. And what do these spiritual forces desire? One thing. One thing, division. Yeah, yeah. They desire to tear us apart. They desire to take us to, to, to separate places. They desire to undo the prayer of Jesus in the Gospel of John. That's what they desire. And when we allow people to be so big, when we allow them to capture our hearts so much, the spiritual forces win. The spiritual forces win. We need to deal with the wrongs that are done. I'm not saying sin should ever be left unaccounted. We need to deal with them. But we need to remember what we're really fighting. 
Finally, I would ask us to do this. I would ask us to turn to Jesus with our pain, with our hurt. Turn to him and see what he can provide. Because the Bible says this. The Bible says we're all thirsty. And there is one source for living water. And that one source is a rock. His name is Jesus. Thank you. One, uh, one thing before we start singing, uh, with, uh, what, what time? So uh, if you have uh, kids in classes right now, um, it's a little bit early to go get them, so let's wait till about 11.25, 11.25, 11.30 to head back and pick up the kids, or you'll deal with some angry teachers, so we don't want to do that. Um, Not really. All right. Our God, he is alive. There is beyond the azure blue a God concealed from human sight. He tipped his skies with heavenly hue and framed the world with his great might. There is a God. should know who speaks from his inspired word. There is a God, a God. he is alive. From mortal mind, God holds the germ within his hand. Though men may search, they cannot find, for God alone does understand. There is a God. sin might set men free and evermore with him could live there is a god